In the very last lecture, we will be talking about ecosystem essentials and terrestrial biomes. Um, as the name implies, we're talking about ecosystems here. And of course, whole courses can be dedicated to ecology and ecosystems. So we're just going to be touching on a few key points. And that is exactly what the real world questions do as well. Most of these questions, as you will see, deal with what I call the evolutionary strategies that are employed by different types of um, terrestrial biomes. Um, but I also have a question there um, that tries to get at the idea of the trophic structure of the ecosystems and where energy comes from and goes in an ecosystem as well. So pay attention to both of those. Let's start with that trophic structure issue and with the issue of um, where, en where energy comes from and goes in ecosystems. So every ecosystem is very heavily impacted by how much sunlight it gets, how much water there is that gets to it via the water cycle, as well as the gases of the atmosphere and the minerals that are found in the earth itself. What happens at the most basic level in an ecosystem is that there are certain um, living things called producers, plants that capture the sun's energy and also water and gases and minerals and turn them into their living things, their bodies. These are in turn consumed. They're consumed by animals that are particularly good at eating vegetable matter and then those consumers can be consumed by carnivorous um, animals. All of this eventually dies and is decomposed by decomposers and that energy is released and goes back into the system. So I ask a question in the real world questions about what happens in a compost pile. If you think about it, all the energy of the sun is being captured by the leaves that you then rake up and put into a compost pile mixed with other um, dead vegetable material that you may take from your kitchen. And if this is released relatively quickly, as it is in a hot compost, you can literally feel the energy that is being released as decomposers um, decompose all of that once living material. There are a number of different things that limit the ecosystem. This includes how much sunlight it gets, what temperature um, temperatures you have, warmer, cold, of course, and how much water is available, available. And that's based not only on the climate, but also how much of the year is water frozen. Soil chemistry will also impact ecosystems as well. And we've talked about all those things before in the course. In this very last lecture, we sort of integrate it all together. And I'll talk about various ecosystems in turn and how these various limiting factors combined with some of the trophic stuff I just mentioned um, help us to understand the evolutionary strategies that are employed by the major plants in ecosystems. Um, this is just a map that shows how much sunlight is received in different parts of the planet. And you can see, of course, that a large amount of that is concentrated in the tropical areas which is not at all surprising. <clears throat> this means that areas in the tropics have very different types of plants than in other places. And as we move further away from where all that available sunlight is, different types of strategies are used by plants to take advantage of different insulation and climatic situations. In tropical rainforests, we have lots and lots of plentiful insulation and lots of plentiful moisture as well. But as we know, the soils tend to be pretty poor because of laterization discussed last time. So what, do, um, the what does the major biome, the rainforest, do in this situation? What do the plants do? Well, they are evolutionarily adapted to do a couple of different things. One, um, to grow lots and lots of biomass because there's so much opportunity for that. Um, some plants will have large canopies that capture all that sunlight. Um, but underneath that, where things are shaded, you'll have other layers of vegetation, all trying to capture all that energy that's available. If you've been to a tropical rainforest before and been down at the very bottom of it, you know it's remarkably dark, simply because all that energy is being captured by the plants above it. The really big trees that have the really big canopies tend to have large 
buttresses in their um, in the, in their structure. Their um, their stumps, right? There are, are very buttressed, which means they've got these big, broad um, structures, and that's because the soils aren't good, so they don't dig their roots very deeply, as you might have in other areas, and sort of spread them horizontally instead. That's, of course, um, largely found in, um, you know, the big trees. And then you have lots of plants that are also growing within the trees themselves, the so-called arboreal species. Here's a diagram that just shows that storied vegetation and the very dense nature of it. And then here are some trees where, um, you know, the, the trunk of the tree is very um, buttressed to support it because its roots can't afford to go deep down into soils that don't have a lot of nutrition. Once we start to move out of the rainforest areas in places where we get seasonal precipitation, these are approaching the savanna areas, but sort of in the transition between tropical rainforest and tropical savannas. Um, the large seasonal rainfalls, dry seasons and wet seasons, mean that you can't grow nearly as much biomass as you did in other places. As a result of this, um, you have not nearly as much large trees growing, and you have a lot of trees that are oftentimes deciduous, or at least semi-deciduous, where they are losing their leaves during the dry season. If they're not, they try to hold on to moisture as much as they can um, by forming very waxy extrusions that help them to reduce um, the potential for evapotranspiration. The soils aren't particularly good. They tend to be fairly laterized and weathered because during the rainy season, there is a lot of precipitation. So the opportunities for growth aren't what they might be in other places. A lot of large browsing animals also live in these areas too. And we're familiar with the large browsing animals of the savanna. And so many trees protect themselves with thorns and very thick barks so-called Dornveld areas. And here are just some images showing these sorts of trees. On the left are people collecting gum arabic, which is associated with the gum arabic tree. Once we move to even drier areas during the winter time, so savanna climates, remember the winter is the dry season, summer is the wet season, um, we run out of trees entirely and start to have more scrubby-like areas with large expanses of dry lands. These are the typical tropical savannas that I think we know from images of safaris and things like that. Again, the soil regimes tend to be mixed, but laterization and weathering tend to dominate in these areas. Many of the plants, especially the larger non-grassland ones, are relatively small. They tend to have thick, um, coverings on them as well, and relatively waxy leaves, again, to reduce that uh, transpiration. They also tend to be adapted to fires um, with large extensive growth during the wet season, and then they dry up and are able to be burned off. Here's a picture showing some of the classic savanna areas. Moving away from the tropics and into the mid-latitudes, there are a couple of different biomes that prosper in these areas. In the humid ones, we tend to get mid-latitude broadleafed and mixed forests. These are areas that have seasonal insulation and they don't have often a lot of water availability during the winter time because the ground is often frozen. And so many of the trees in these areas adopt the strategy of losing their leaves every winter time when there isn't much sun and not enough water anyhow, and then completely regrowing their canopy of leaves during the summertime when there is bountiful sunshine and a lot of moisture as well. These trees don't need to be big and buttressed. They can be large trees, but they don't need that buttressed trunk because um, they have much better soils in these areas. These areas tend to have alpha sols and eutosols, which can be weathered, of course, but tend also to have calcification acting as a regime. Now, once we start to move further and further north and the availability of water 
and sunlight is less than it is in the other mid-latitude areas, the trees actually tend to retain their leaves all year round. The, tr the leaves, though, are, of course, needles. And what the trees are doing here is trying to reduce their amount of transpiration by having very small leaves that are very good at retaining moisture during the winter time, but then holding on to those leaves all year round. So as soon as the sun returns and moisture returns, they can immediately begin to grow and compete with their neighbors. If they lost their leaves and had to regrow them, which a few trees do in this area, for example, tamarack trees do that, um, then they would not have the advantage to be able to compete against spruce trees or pine trees, for example, that retain their needles all year round. Typically, the soils in these areas are spotosols or even worse than that. And again, as a result of that, you tend not to get really large trees. Um, the root systems are unable to support um, really big things like we have in broadleafed areas or tropical rainforest areas. There are, however, areas that get a lot more moisture, and these are the temperate rainforests. Think the marine west coast areas, like coastal parts of western United States. They still get a lot of seasonal insulation, so you tend to get a combination both of deciduous trees and coniferous trees here. Um, and the soils vary greatly. Again, everything from relatively good alpha sols to not so good spotosols. You get the same vertical structuring you did in tropical rainforests. These uh, biomass production is very high in these areas, but not quite as great as the tropical rainforest areas. The trees are not as buttressed, generally speaking. The root systems are able to get into the earth and use it more effectively than they do in tropical areas. Moving from the Pacific Northwest down into California or into the entire Mediterranean are where we find the Mediterranean shrublands. These are areas where the winter time is the growing season, but it's not a great growing season typically because it's relatively cool and there's not much insulation in these areas. But during the summer, there tends to be huge soil moisture deficits. And there's often salinization in these areas. But many of the areas also have calcification taking place with um, alpha sol like soils. And so these areas can be very good for growing, particularly if you can irrigate areas. But the vegetation um, in these areas, these shrubland areas, tend to be plants that reduce their transpiration by having um, very hard leaves and waxy leaves. Again, chaparral is a great example of this. Um, and you also have plants that are adapted to deal with fire effectively as well. Many of the fruits that come from these areas natively are very thick skinned to reduce transpiration during the summertime. So think citrus fruits. Um, as the picture of this lemon tree shows. And then here is just an image from a relatively untouched Mediterranean shrubby area. Pictures of grapes growing and um, cork trees grow in this area as well. And here are people harvesting cork in the traditional manner. Cork, of course, very thick bark, helps to reduce transpiration. Moving into the interiors of continents is where you find the big grassland areas. These are areas where mollusols are found and calcification occurs. Arid conditions have big summer moisture deficits, but the soil is very good. And so the grasses that do grow in this area tend to have very well-developed root systems. But trees tend not to dominate in this area except in moist areas along rivers and creeks because fire is endemic in these areas during the summertime when you do have those big moisture deficits. So you get a lot of sod grass growing. And when you're able to dig into that sod grass and begin to turn it into agricultural land, it becomes great for growing grains. These areas typically have large grazing animals like bison that took advantage of the sod. And here's a picture of wheat growing in an area like this. Once we get to desert areas, um, things change and we really get plants that are using many of the 
um, strategies that we talked about in the uh, Dornveld areas and also in um, the Mediterranean areas. These so-called xerophytic plants that use tap roots to get into deep water sources or spread their roots to try to take advantage of any rainfall when it does come. But generally speaking, very small, very waxy leaves or some ability to store water as you have with cacti. And this is generally the case both for warm and cold deserts. One of the cool things that often appears in desert areas are so-called ephemeral plants. And these are plants that really only bloom, the desert blooms, right, right after you've had a big rainfall event. And here are some arid climate photographs of vegetation. And then finally, we have Arctic and Alpine tundra areas where you have a very limited growing season. You have a lot of permafrost, a very small um, but active zone of area that can be grown. The soils tend to not be very good because of the frost heaving and the cryobertion cryo that we talked about last time. Um, the plants tend to be very herbaceous. They tend to grow very slowly. Um, and they tend to not be very productive areas. So in the very last assignment, you can of course look at the instructions on how to do that. You're going to be looking at something called the National Land Cover Database, and you're gonna use <coughs> the map, maps that you see there, to try to interpret and draw conclusions about how all the various different things we've talked about in this course probably impact the land cover in this area. What do you think is happening with the climate in an area? with the soils in an area, with the vegetation in an area? And how can we understand that land cover, um, drawing conclusions from all that we've learned over the course of this semester, which I hope has been productive for you. Thanks a lot, and as always, feel free to ask me any questions.